Hi everyone, thanks for joining us this evening for gaining greater access for people with hearing loss with Lisa Hamlin. First I would like to thank Cindy Thompson from Alternative Communication Services for captioning tonight's webinar. Thanks so much Cindy, appreciate it. Uh, many of you know Lisa Hamlin, she's been with HLAA since 2008 and has been an advocate for people with hearing loss for many years. So without further ado, here's Lisa Hamlin. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you, Nancy. Um, and thanks, everybody, for showing up this evening. I, I recognize many of the names. So it's good to see your names there. Hopefully, I'll see a, a lot of you at the convention as well. As Nancy said, um, Lisa Hamlin. I've been at Hearing Loss Association since 2008 as staff, but I have been part of of HLAA and SHHH before that since 1990. So I've been around a while and I have a hearing loss myself. I wear a cochlear implant and a hearing aid. So I wanted to let you know all that. Um, I want to, first up front is I want to talk about the mission of Hearing Loss Association of America. It's to open the world of communication to people with hearing loss by providing information, education, support, and advocacy. And I always thought the advocacy should be first. I was corrected today by our coworker Hollis who told me I should put it last, not first. So that's our official mission statement, but always in my heart is advocacy is first. Um, we do, for people who don't know about us, we do have a network that includes local chapters, state organization, and our office is in Bethesda, Maryland. So what I will be going through tonight is uh, we'll talk a little bit about our public policy agenda, which has been in place for about a year now. We have brand new policy statements. Some of you may have seen it on our e-news that came up just last week, or two, maybe two weeks ago now. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how you can work locally on advocacy and so in such a way that it dovetails with the kind of work we're doing nationally. Uh, we'll talk a little bit also about some um, proposed legislation. This is federal legislation now, Medicare coverage of hearing aids and the tax credit for hearing aids. And then a little bit about programs we have, the Hearing Loop program, and updating you on movie captioning because that's pretty hot. So I'll give you a little bit of that. Um, I wanted to let you know that how we will do this is that if you have questions, write them down. Um, people who know me know I'm a pretty informal speaker, but the webinar is a different kind of animal. So I'd like you to write your questions down. You can pop them into the chat room. You can write them down at any point, um, and then Nancy will capture them and will give them to me at the end of my presentation rather than interrupting because it's just too hard to look at the captioning and my slides and, and everything that's there. Okay, so if you do it that way, and Nancy, correct me if I'm wrong, if you would prefer to write, type in the chat room if you prefer for people to wait to type their questions at the end, but I know how these things go with questions. You think of something and then you forget it. So write it down as soon as you think it, even by hand if you don't get it in the chat room. Okay, I wanted to start off be, with the ADA because we've reached 25 years of the Americans with Disabilities Act and that's quite a, a milestone here. The, for people, I, it's hard for me to know, I know many of the people in this room already know about the ADA and know it well, but in case you didn't know about it because there are many people with hearing loss who do not know about the ADA, uh, it is a civil rights law. It promises equal opportunity in employment, state and access to state and local government, to public transportation, access to public places, and to telecommunications. Well, I wanted to also let you know, and it, you'll see more about this if you get the Hearing Loss magazine in July, I've written an article that talks about the ADA and how SHHH was there right from the beginning. SHHH was 10 years old at that point. We're, we're going to be celebrating our 35th anniversary at the convention. And it was, it, back then Rocky Stone was there, Brenda Patat was there, Barbara Kelly was there, um, even Nancy Macklin was around in the early days there. 
and we were all working towards supporting passage of the ADN. And Brenda, in her early writings at um, what was then called SHHH the magazine, uh, was talking about writing letters into members of Congress to get it passed. And she also talked about a vigilite, uh, excuse me, a vigil, a candlelight vigil that went from uh, from the Capitol to the White House to support passage of the ADN. And then when it did pass, their founder, Rocky Stone, was appointed to the Access Board to help develop the guidelines. So it was very much something on our minds and something, it was very different for people with disabilities to get a civil rights law and it's been very important to us. And I think the major thing that the ADA has done is raised awareness about the needs of people with disabilities. What do we need? How do we need it? How do we ask for it? That's really been a major contribution by the ADA. It hasn't done everything we wanted it to do. We would love to wave a magic wand and have access for everyone all the time. It doesn't quite work that way, but we have gotten much better. We, we now have accommodations in the workplace that we didn't have prior to the ADA. We have hearing induction loops, other assisted listening devices in museums and theaters, public places all around. We have captioning on television and on the internet, and though that wasn't a direct, there were different laws that covered that. It, it's my feeling that the whole, the whole error uh, was looking toward including people with disabilities, and by having captioning, that was bringing in people with hearing loss. Now we have it on the internet, which is a brand new, re relatively new law. I guess it's five years old now, uh, with, uh, that will provide internet access as well. And of course, we have captioned telephones. We have the relay that was part of the ADA. We now have applications on our mobile phones for, for that as well, for telephones, caption, ca caption apps. And we have visual messaging at transportation. So there's a whole, there's a range of um, different access that we have that we just didn't have 25 years ago. So if we have all that access, why do we need a public policy? Why do I even have a job? Um, and I think most of the people on the call know as well as far as we've come, and we've come pretty far, um, we still aren't quite there yet. So we hear regularly now, and, and it surprises me how often we hear uh, about people who are in places of employment who aren't provided access to staff meetings or teleconferences, um, who even in getting applications have a hard time. They're not providing the accommodations they need. So we regularly receive that. Um, we know that listening systems are not always there, even though they're supposed to be there. They're not always there. Or more likely, they're in places but not properly installed, poorly maintained, so they don't work. We know that the requests for CART, um, people don't know what to do with it. You say you want you say you have a hearing loss and need to have access. They say, well, we have an interpreter, um, and what's CART? So we need to open up the world to understand what CART and captioning really mean. And then, of course, they're inaccessible hospitals, doctor's offices, schools, lawyers' offices. Um, we know I can. there's a litany of places we still don't have the access that we need. So, so a year ago, we looked at this and we said, well, what do we want to do? What are our goals? Where would we go? And we created a public policy agenda. We have this on our website, so we'll have it here at the webinar, but you can also look at our website and see our public policy agenda goals. And we list them, but I also wanted to talk about what are our goals, but how can you work locally to achieve the goals in your state or in your town? so that you can, we're working together toward the same type of goal, but it will be slightly different because local issues are often different than they are on a national level. So for example, we start, we, one of the critical things that we felt right away was having um, people recognize, simply recognize the fact that hearing is critical to healthy living and hearing loss impacts all aspects of life. Just a simple fact that we know, people with hearing loss know that, but the greater community somehow is not paying attention to them. So 
So one of the things we are looking, one of our goals was to get hearing screenings to be part of wellness visits for all ages. And we've created a public policy. This is one of the brand new public policy papers. Um, and for people who also don't know, what happens with public policy papers is that we um, it will have an idea. The board will have an idea or the staff will have an idea and we will sit down and write a paper. And then the board as a whole must take a look at it um, and by consensus or by majority will look at the paper, take it apart, tweak it, and then when we're done, if everybody agrees, we have the finished product. And that's what we've got with our, we have a whole list of public policy papers, which you can get by also going to our website and looking at About Us, or you can look in the advocacy section too. So this newest one asks for screening for hearing loss in primary health care settings. Now this is for adults. We're looking, we know that this is done for children. Not consistently, and maybe not as many as places or as well as we want, but we know that kids are looked at, but adults are not. Once you once you reach a majority, everybody says, well, if you're on your own. But we have found that um, people actually pay attention to their doctors. So you get screened for hearing loss and the doctor says you should be referred to an audio, you know, I'm going to refer you to an audiologist. People pay attention to that, much more so than when their spouse says, Fred, you're not hearing me. Um, they're not going to go, to go and get their audiogram done. So we really believe this is going to be a step forward for public understanding and awareness of hearing loss. Now locally, what we would have you do is talk to your primary care settings. Let them, let them, uh, let them know, the doctors, the nurses, the, um, anyone in primary care that says what's hearing loss about, you can let them know that screening is important to you because we don't have the research and the data we need, but if people keep a drumbeat up, we believe that this could be accomplished. Um, another one of our goals is hearing aids, cochlear implants, and oral rehabilitation are affordable and accessible and covered by Medicare and the Affordable Care Act and third-party payers. Um, so for this, we are supporting H.R. 1653, that's the Medicare Hearing Aid Coverage Act of 2015 that was introduced this year by Representative Debbie Dingo from uh, Michigan. Well, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but it's certainly, we, last year we supported a, a bill introduced by uh, Representative Cartwright. We are now on the road. We believe this is an important piece of legislation and we, we are looking for support in the states and we're looking to make sure that the, our senators, our members of Congress, our representatives all know that this is important to us. Uh, we've also created a, a public policy statement on that. And locally, again, if you could get sign-ons from your representative, this is, we only have a bill in the House, and it's, um, and it's going to be a long haul. This is not going to be a slam dunk. But we need your support to let people know that this is an important issue to you. Um, we're also looking at affordable and accessible hearing health care, along with a uh, appropriate consumer choice, education, and transparency. And so we created another public policy paper that would provide wider access to the full spectrum of hearing technology benefiting people with hearing loss. So we're looking, when we say the full spectrum, we're talking about everything. We're talking about hearing aids, we're talking about um, assistive devices, we're talking also about something called PSAPs, which is the Personal Sound Amplification Product, which I have a little picture up there of one example of a PSAP. These are devices that used to be um, used to be the kind of thing you saw in the back of Parade magazine, which said that you can hear a whisper across the room, um, and we weren't so sure you could actually do that. But now there are products out there that really do provide excellent they provide excellent sound. They're not for everyone. I would probably never wear one with my hearing loss is so significant. This is usually for people who are a milder or moderate hearing loss. But it's, um, it's a stepping stone. They're much less expensive than a hearing aid. So they'll cost $300, $400 as opposed to $4,000. And it's, to me, it's a way in for people who say, oh, no, I'm not going to buy a hearing aid. I'm not going to spend $4,000 on something I don't know will work for me. This is a way to, to get into the market. 
Um, but it's not easy. It's controversial. The FDA at this point is telling us that, uh, we're telling everyone that they cannot market PSAPs to people with hearing loss. You can, they are intended, they originally came out as a kind of a hunter's helper thing. You go out in the forest and you want to hear a deer and you could put this in your ear and you would be able to hear the rustling of the leaves. Um, but now, it, and, and back again, when the technology wasn't so wonderful, then it was not a big deal for us. The hearing aids really were the standard of care that we wanted to go for. But it's a, there are, is real technology out there and what we seek is transparency. How are they made? How can we tell? How can consumers tell the difference between something that's really good and something not so good and standards so that we all know that we're all starting from the same baseline. So that is a big thing that we're doing and, and we will continue to do that. Um, we're also looking, we also are sponsor for the, one of the sponsors, there are several sponsors, for a consensus study at the Institute of Medicine and the study is on the accessible and affordable hearing health care for adults. Um, now the Institute of Medicine is, when they conduct a consensus study, it is well regarded. We expect to have a report that people can look at. The people on the consensus committee are um, professionals and people across the board who have an interest and, and willingness to spend, it's, I believe the entire time is 18 months looking into this. So we look forward to seeing that report. We hope that that also will look at ways to evaluate accessible and affordable health care. Now locally, you could join advisory boards, provide oversight to the audiologist dispensers. You could provide consumer perspective on affordable affordability, transparency, quality of care. There are things you can do to get involved. Most states, for example, have an advisory board that looks at the at dispensers and or audiologists. And you can, those meetings are often open to the public. You may be able to sit on those boards. It's a way for you to provide direct input on, this, on these um, really important matters. Um, the, one of our other goals, is that public and private venues, including all types of public transportation, are communication accessible through technology, such as hearing loops, FM, infrared, captioning, and other, other technologies, as any new technology that comes along. So we have, we've continued with our work on the Get in the Hearing Loop project. Um, we continue to work on that, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, too. Uh, we are on the Access Board. I represent HLAA on the Access Board's Committee on the Rail Vehicle Access Advisory Committee, where we are looking at, well, how do you build a rail car that is accessible? And that's across the board, not just for people with hearing loss, but people with mobility disabilities, people with vision loss. Um, so that, that when they get on the train, it, oh, first of all, they can get on the train, and then they can move about the train and, and understand what's going on. And a particular interest to me is also making sure that emergency messaging is, is accessible. So we are suggesting, and again, this is a very beginning stages, but we are suggesting that loops could be used in trains. We are suggesting that signage, that if there's an announcement, the signage says the same thing on the trains. Um, we're hoping that these things get adopted. We will tell the Access Board as a committee, and there's uh, many people on this committee as well. Um, so they, they also are representatives of industry as well as consumer advocacy groups and individuals. And they take all the information together. The Access Board will take the information we put together, and then after that they will provide guidelines, and then they'll go through the process. This could take some time, but the process will be that when they're done, they they provide it to the Department of Transportation, and then a rulemaking comes after that. So don't expect your rail cars to be mandated to provide loops anytime soon. However, what we've noticed is that a number of industry people are watching what we're doing, and they are listening to what's going on, 
and some of them will provide, we've heard that in California, for example, they are experimenting with putting loops on the trains. So something, even though it's not mandated, some people will move ahead with accessible elements that we've been talking about in these committees. Um, we also, one of our goals is that all education and entertainment media, by which we mean television, internet, video programming, movies, will meet the highest quality of captioning and audio quality standards that ensure equal access, full understanding, and enjoyment by consumers. So we, um, a lot of that is provided, well, with the exception of the movie access, the television and internet and video programming, that it all comes under the jurisdiction of the Federal Communications Commission, and HLA has joined the newly formed Disability Advisory Committee, which we call DAC. And we've had several meetings, and we will continue to provide input to the FCC. So they, now the FCC has already created rules about quality standards for captioning on television, and, and it relates directly into internet as well. So those qualities, not all the standards have gone into effect yet, but we are very involved with making sure that, um, that captioning on television is better and continues to get better. And we're working with um, captioning providers as well as with uh, the industry to try to make sure that best practices are, are adhered to and that in the end we get good captions. Now your role again can be, you can have a role in this as well. Oh, that's our, I'm sorry, I, I forgot to put the picture in. That is the full DAC, the full Disability Advisory Committee. Here you see there are a lot of people on these committees and even our subcommittees are very big too. So we're working hard and there's a lot of industry members as well as consumer groups and individuals. Okay, so locally what you can do is please provide complaints or compliments to federal agencies or local agencies, uh, whatever has, whoever has jurisdiction. Um, you can go to the FCC, you can go to your provider, you can go to your, if it's a broadcaster that provided uh, captions you're not happy with, talk to them. You can talk to your cable phone or satellite company, um, but talk to somebody. And you can give them kudos. I saw a wonderful program once that the, the caption was just so well done. It was a live program. It was in. It was almost in sync. It was four seconds off, and it was beautifully done. All the lyrics of the music was were there, and so I complimented them. I said, "You are doing a great job." And they, I think providers need to hear that as well. So we need to keep tabs on how how it's going, both good and bad, and we need to let the FCC know because otherwise they don't have a record. They don't know what's going on. Um, other things we're working on, another goal is that consumers will have comprehensive choice and access to captioned and hearing aid compatible high fidelity landline phones and mobile devices. Again, we provide feedback to the FCC. There's a petition before the FCC to provide um, what's called wideband audio, and it's just what it sounds like. It's got more information going over the phone line, um, and it is fabulous. I have heard it. You know, I've heard it on a landline phone. It actually uses the internet, is my understanding, and it provides, because it's digital, it provides more information than you get from the, the analog phone lines. So we're looking forward to that. That's also going to be pro provided, on, actually it's now provided, I believe, it, last year both Sprint and T-Mobile provided HD, what they call HD or wideband, high definition wideband audio. But the problem is it's not interoperable, and that's a problem across the board. So we're talking to the FCC and saying, look, this is important to us. It will make people with hearing loss have an easier time hearing on the phone, and we support interoperability. It shouldn't be just T-Mobile users get to talk to T-Mobile users. It should be T-Mobile, Verizon, AT&T, Sprint. They're all talking to each other. It doesn't matter which provider you have, you get access to HD wideband audio. And again, you were doing it, but you can do it as well. Provide feedback to the FCC, um, not just on HD audio, but also on what's happening with your captioning phones, what's happening with your landline phones, how about the mobile devices, what's going on. They need to hear because, again, we can 
send them information, and we do. We work with them all the time. But it, it's good to have it come from the locals because, and again, I don't hear everything that's going on. So if you know something that's going on, it's good to hear from you from, through me, but also directly to the FCC. Um, another goal of the policy agenda is that we have a linkage, that the consumers are actively involved in the design and development of emerging technology, uh, emerging hearing assistive technology specifically. But we're also looking at all kinds of technology. And we are part of several advisory boards and groups, and we provide them information. But we'd like to see that happen around the state. Uh, we know that some companies have focus groups. We'd like to be part of them. We want them to think about hearing loss right from the beginning of a development of a product, not at the end. Now, we're already talking, and some of the things we're hearing is that the education of kids coming out of high school is not great, and they want to see more education. They want to see the designers who understand disability access and universal design coming out of high schools and out of colleges. and there, there, it's a big need, apparently. We have heard from IBM and others who are saying we really don't want to have to do the training. We, we're, they're willing to do it, but they want to see more people well trained. So if you're interested in that aspect, you can get involved in that as well. Um, there really is a huge need there. But we also want not just the designers to know, we do want them to know, but we want consumers to say, this is what I need. This is what you're not thinking of. So we will provide. So if you can provide that information locally or even to me, and then I'll provide it to them, that would be wonderful. We are also, another one of our goals is providing hearing assistive technology products that are compatible and interoperable regardless of the brand through open source wireless technology. Now, one of the things we are also, again, we, when we sit on boards, we tell the tech companies what we're looking for. Um, and there, is a good, there are a good number of products that are interoperable that you can use. But we worry about um, the fact that a lot of companies want to make everything proprietary. So if I have Phonak, I need to use, I get the best results by using only Phonak products. Or if I have Apple, I have my Apple that goes to Resound or just Starkey, then that's all I can use. We would love to see more interoperability. And that's our perspective, and that's what we're telling um, the tech companies. We also are hopeful for brand new technologies that we don't yet see, haven't seen. We've heard things about having, um, for example, having a microphone that instead of going through a system or a sound system, have a microphone on a stage that goes directly to your ear. Um, that would be great. It, we need that kind of technology that may happen someday in the future to be something that happens no matter what, no matter what hearing aid you wear, no matter whose brand you buy, that all of that is interoperable. Um, and so, again, you can provide information directly to manufacturers. You can provide it to us. Whatever you can do locally is a big help to our efforts on a national level. Um, and then another public, another one of our public policy goals is emergency preparedness. And this is something that I've worked on for a number of years. Um, and this, we want to make sure that emergency preparedness and communication systems are accessible for people with hearing loss and first responders are knowledgeable about the needs of persons with hearing loss. Now, we've worked with the FCC on this. Um, emergency communications is uh, high on the list of priorities for the FCC. So we have been making headway on that. One of the things that's most recent is the efforts to get text messaging to 911. And it's rolling out. And the last I heard is that there are approximately 6,000 what are also called PSAPs, only in this case they're the, um, um, OK, so I'm thinking of personal sound amplification devices. It's not that. PSAPs are the, are the, dis, the dispatchers in emergencies. So when you call somebody, it, um, you get to the PSAT first. So text to 911, they don't have that capability. They have a capability for phone, and they have capability for TTY. So if you still have your TTY, you can you get to 911. Um, but they don't have text to 911. So if you're in a situation where you can't use your telephone or use your voice, it's a 
problem. But they're beginning to, out of those 6,000 PSAPs, there's about 300 that are on board with this. The providers, uh, Verizon, Sprint, um, AT&T, and uh, T-Mobile are all on board, so they can provide a text to 911 signal. The problem is, is it's getting the, the locals to accept it. And that is a matter of money in some cases. We've also heard in some rural areas it's also a matter of not wanting to be told by the federal government what to do, wanting to have the control locally. But if you, sh you show your local people that this is something that should be supported and that monies locally should go to, then that would be a big help rolling this out. So we want to see more of that. Um, if you have questions about that, too, let me know. We'll get you in on that. Okay, so that's, that's basically our public policy agenda. Um, it, this is a living document. It will move. It will change. And we'll, as we see things that we really need to address, we will move forward and we'll change those things. And your input always is important to us. We want to make sure that the public policy agenda fits your needs as well. So we covered a lot there. But again, if you have other things, you should let us know that you, whether it should be on the agenda or whether we should have more emphasis on some area than another. So some of the things we are looking at from the federal legislation we're looking at is the Medicare Hearing Aid Coverage Act of 2015, as I mentioned before. Um, Representative Debbie Dingo wanted to, this to be among her first, she's a freshman, she wanted to be her, among her first uh, bills that she provided, and so we were very happy to support that. We wrote a letter of support um, and have been in contact with her staff around this, and we know, again, I said it before, it's true, it's not going to be easy, but it's something I think that's hugely important. And if nothing else, it brings attention to the fact, I, we talk to legislators all the time and they're always surprised that Medicare does not cover hearing aids. So bringing it to their attention, bring, raising the education level is a huge part of this. Um, she also, so the bill itself requir requires a removal of the exclusion, Medicare exclusion, both for the hearing aid itself and the examinations. Now you, you can get an exam, but it can't be specifically for the purpose of getting a hearing aid under Medicare. Um, the other thing she's looking at and she's put in this bill is a GAO study, which is the government accounting office, which study and report on hearing aid programs. So they're looking at programs that already provide assistance, whether it's private insurance or um, in some cases the Affordable Care Act also provides some coverage in some states. They can look at that as well. But they also are looking at examining the number of people who need hearing aids. Um, it'll be interesting. I'm not how sh quite sure how they're going to get that information. We know approximately, we, information we get from the hearing aid industry is only about 20% of people who could benefit from hearing aids actually have them. So I'd love to see them corroborate that um, and we'll, we'll see where it goes. The other piece of legislation we support actively is the hearing aid tax credit. This has been reintroduced this year, both in the House and the Senate. Uh, it is the same bill, uh, the text is the same as last year, which is a tax credit of up to $500 per hearing aid every five years for anyone. There's no exclusions in terms of who can have it, adults or dependents, um, except for the fact that if you earn more than $200,000 a year, you're not eligible for this tax credit. So we continue to support that and there is a coalition of people including the hearing aid industry and audiologists um, who support that bill. The other, we continue also to work and get in the hearing loop project. Um, we have an active committee. We are an advisory committee that meets regularly. Um, and has some really important and good information that we share and helps move the project along. We have created a hearing, uh, get in the hearing loop toolkit. Uh, it's almost ready for prime time, I hear. Um, we'll talk about access to libraries, houses of worship, and theaters as some of the first goals. And so the toolkit looks specifically at those things to help people provide that information. Again, we'd love to have this also work locally because I think that's in this, particularly in this case, that's where the rubber hits the road. 
And that is to promote loops in your own town. So we'd love to see people get involved locally for that. Uh, movie captioning. I'm just going to bring you up to speed on this. This happened. Um, this has been going on for a while. The U.S. Department of Justice has had an AMPRM, which is an Advanced Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, that closed back in 2011. So they put it out in 2010, where they asked for comments about movie captioning. Um, we commented then. And then again, then they had the NPRM, which was the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. And that closed back in, that closed for comments back in 2014, in December. For those comments, HLA joined with others in filing group comments for the NPRM. So we worked with NATO, which is the National Association of Theater Owners. It's not those guys out in, the, in Europe taking care of the, the, the uh, military out there, not that. This is National Association of Theater Owners. So we worked with them and it was actually a really good working session where we knocked out an agreement because what had happened is that the proposal that the um, Department of Justice came up with, NATO, the theater owners felt that they were asking for minimums that were way too high for their theaters because not every theater needs a lot of hearing. Uh, and for this, okay, let me back up a little. This is specifically for movie captioning. So they were looking at, well, how many devices are we going to put in each of these theaters? So the big thing was the Department of Justice said all theaters must be covered all the time and all screens must be covered, which was very big and very positive for us. But how many of them do you put in? Well, it really pr depends on where you are. In a community like Rochester, New York, where there's a very big deaf group and, hard of, and a very active hard of hearing group as well, there is way more usage than in other places. And perhaps Albany, New York has a much fewer usage. So why put the same number of devices in Rochester as in Albany, as in New York City? As in, let it, we wanted, to, we listened to them and said, let's have this um, be adjustable based on how many people are actually using the devices. They must, the theater owners must keep track of them and they must report it out to the Department of Justice. Now that was a proposal that was our recommendation with NATO. Um, the Department of Justice has to look at that comment and everybody else's comments, which they're actively doing. The last we heard is that maybe by this fall, They'll have some comments out. We don't know for sure. We are hoping they will come sooner rather than later. And the other people, just to also mention, the others that worked on this, other consumer organizations were ALDA, the Association of Late Deaf and Adults, uh, Alexandra Graham Bell Association of the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, and the National Association of the Deaf. So it was a really a good agreement. We also had some voluntary agreements. For example, one of the things that we're working on now is that um, not all independent films uh, automatically caption their movies. So we're working together with NATO to try to formulate a letter to send to those independents to educate them about the need. Um, so we'll see. Until the Department of Justice rules, there's no there's no regulations right now that requires it. So we're hoping to see the regs come soon and come out positively for us. Obviously, we'd like to see that. So this is some of the things I was talking about. Also, it covers audio description. That's not, we didn't comment on audio description, but other groups did. But this was incorporated in our joint comments because um, the movie theaters must must be watching that as well. Um, and timelines and timetables. We wanted to make sure that this, when we had this joint agreement, it wouldn't last, it wouldn't be forever. We had real definite timetables for them to follow. Um, we also included require for mar requirements for marketing, staff training, and equipment maintenance. From our experience, again, with assisted listening devices, we wanted to make sure they were maintained and there were signage. And there were signage not only for the moviegoers, but for the staff, too, so they would know how to use them. And we committed to these voluntary actions as well. So that's, I've left plenty of time, knowing my um, 
Hearing Loss Association of America members and friends. I know that there's often a lot of questions, so I left a lot of time for questions from you all. Um, I'm happy to elaborate on any one of the things I talked about or if you know of other issues we're working on. If I know about them, I'll talk about them. If I don't know about them, I'll tell you I don't know and I'll get back to you. So Nancy, can we open this up for Absolutely. questions now? Absolutely, and you have several questions in the queue already. Um, Vicki from the Colorado Springs chapter wants to know, she says, CART is so expensive to provide. What can be done to bring down the cost? What can be done? Okay, so I have, I'm reading the captions because I have trouble hearing Nancy as well. It's the, the sync problem I'm having. Um, what can be done to bring down the cost of captioning? The, I think it's an issue that I think it's a, the captioning cost is based on the market. So for example, um, obviously where you are is expensive. It's also expensive in DC area where there's just huge demand for it. I think it's a matter of what the market bears. I think it's a matter of if we have more captioners out there and more car uh, providers out there, the cost will go down. Um, we're looking at a situation in the movie and, excuse me, in the television captioning where there's huge competition and the cost has gone down. Um, sometimes the quality has too because some, some providers who are not quite ready for prime time are on prime time. But that's why we need our quality standards. But I think it's the same thing for CART, is that we need to create a situation where we encourage more people to get the education they need to provide CART. Um, and frankly, and I know that CART people are aware of this too, the other thing that's going to happen is the, um, the text speech to text is going to begin to be much better as time goes on. We're still we still haven't gotten there yet. You still, there are too many glitches on that. But at some point, that will also become a real competition for CART. But other than that, um, that I, I think we just have to wait for the market. And if you can encourage local schools to provide more uh, CART courses, you'll get more people in, in, those, in the marketplace who will be able to compete for better pricing. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question comes from our friend Joe Gordon. He says, devices give you good amplification but poor quality. Can you comment on that? Okay, uh, okay Joe, you're saying devices give, devices get you good amplification but poor quality. Okay, so you're saying that the quality, the fidelity is not great. Um, you know, it's, I think that's a matter of standards too. We really need to have good standards in there. And I'm not certain, this is something I don't know because I'm not a tech person, but I believe that we need to have standards for assistive devices so, the, so it's not just a matter of your right of amplification, but the fidelity of these products are, um, is consistent and something that you can measure and something that we can know from one product to the next what we're buying and whether we're buying something you know you know how if you buy a cheap microphone you're going to get poor quality um, but if you, and you buy an expensive microphone you get better we, we should have the same kind of consistency for our assisted listening devices Adelaide brings up the topic of um, requesting a loop. And in her situation, she would like to ask the manager of a public dance hall to consider a loop so that she can hear the, the calls for the dancing, or how to do the dance. Um, I think you may have touched on this a little bit when you talked about the loop toolkit, but maybe you could talk about that a little bit more, about um, what might be included in that so that people can advocate in their own communities. Okay. Um, I, yes. When we get the loop toolkit up on our website, you'll be able to see you'll be able to see the kinds of techniques you can use to advocate for loops in your area. 
Um, they may not, again, we're going to look at libraries and places of worship and theaters first, but some of the things are translatable. Even if you see a loop kit that goes up first on one topic, you can use it for different topics. So we will be able to help you um, t using techniques. Who do you approach? How do you approach them? Uh, you can, and if, for example, a dance hall is a place of public accommodation. So in that situation, you can go there and say, you need effective communication. You need to be able to hear what's going on. Um, and you believe the loop, would the audio induction loop, we're calling the hearing induction loop, would be the best solution for you. We've also heard, by the way, that there's some, uh, some people who refer to neck loops and audio room loops as the same thing. So be careful about what you say. but. Um, I would approach them. The first thing you do is you approach, and you say, "We uh, this would provide the best access, the best communication access for me. Can you do this?" And then, uh, then when you get resistance, then go to the toolkit, and they'll give you more help and more techniques to try to approach them. Also, it helps to have other people with you. So if you're with a chapter, if you're with a group of people, and you're working together, and you're polite, and you're, again, people want to see that if you're in a, a dance hall, you want to have more people. You don't want to have people go away. You want to accommodate as many people as possible. If it means bringing people in who will pay for tickets or, or pay for your classes or whatever is happening in the hall, then they're more likely to want to accommodate you. So that's, I think, the angle to take is that you're bringing in more possibilities, more people, and, and also helping them find it. The other thing we find is that um, we really need to be careful about who installs the loop. We want to make sure that they adhere to the international code of standards on this, make sure that the people who are provide the loops know what they're doing. And, and, and I don't get it. I, you need to vet them like you would anybody else. So, I don't understand why people can't understand that you know, when they hire somebody to replace their flooring, they make sure they get quotes and they make sure they know the experience and the expertise of the people coming in. You need to do the same thing with looping. Make sure the people know what they're doing who are installing your loop. When, so will, the that the loop helps. when will the loop kit be ready to go, uh, Lisa? When will the loop kit be ready to go? Uh, very soon. I don't have an exact date, but it's coming up very soon. We're talking about, um, I would say, weeks. In, I'm hoping before the convention uh, that we'll have at least a part of the kit up. But I, I don't have a date on that. But I can get back to you. Adele, if you want to email me, and I have my email address on after this. But here, let me put my email address up. Um, you can email me, and then I'll find out for you when the loop kit will be ready, um, ready to go. Okay. The next question comes from Winans. He uh, says, "How will HR 1653 be funded? Does the Hearing Aid Coverage Act include provisions for raising Medicare taxes or generating additional revenue to provide hearing aid coverage?" The bill was exactly as I told you. It's a very simple, very short bill. What happens in Congress now is a bill doesn't get passed until somebody figures out how to pay for it. And that is um, a negotiation that happens for each bill. So I can't tell you now how it would get funded. Um, I can't tell you that, you know, what, what kind of, uh, again, why or how much it would be funded. But I can tell you some of the things that we're looking at now, for example, is that one of the things that people always got scared about when they said, oh, Medicare, there's so many people with hearing loss. I and mean, we always say there's 48, well, we said for many years there's 36 million. There's somewhere between 36 million and 48 million people with hearing loss. And as I said before, only 20% of those people who could benefit from hearing aids. So we're not talking about people profoundly deaf, and we're not talking about people who have such a mild hearing loss they really don't need a hearing aid. So 20% of the people who could benefit from hearing aids get them. So people say, oh my god, you know, there's going to be so many people who need it. So first of all, it's my feeling that even, even when the, if this passed tomorrow, ev not everybody's going to run out by a hearing aid 
the next day. It's just not going to happen. We know about people with hearing loss. They deny. They say, oh, I'll do it later. And, not, not, and not, they're not going to be beating down people's doors. The second thing that I think people forget about is that when, when we buy hearing aids now, they cost, what, $3,000, $4,000. You buy an inexpensive one that can cost $1,500, but I've heard $4,000. I've heard $5,000 for one aid. Okay, so somebody is willing to spend $10,000 on two hearing aids. Um, but that's the market price now. That's for individual costs. That's for when you have an audiologist who has to worry about keeping his shop open or her shop open, um, advertising overhead, taking care of the programming. That, that's for that hearing aid. The VA pays much, much less per hearing aid. So we believe that Medicare can set pricing and can set buying rates that would keep the cost down and make this act not so outrageously expensive. That's the hope. That's the thought. We understand that there's going to be a lot of resistance to adding on any extra fees to Medicare. I mean, everybody has um, their own issues and things that they feel Medicare should open up to. But it, to us, it's just, I have heard too many people call me personally. Um, I'll, I'll never forget the, the son of a, an 80-year-old woman who was living on a fixed income. He didn't have a lot to give his mom. Um, and she, both of her hearing aids died at the same time. Uh, what do you tell somebody? No, you can't hear anymore? Uh, it just seems, it just, it's just not the right thing to do to leave people off of Medicare who have no other way to get a hold of a, a hearing aid. Okay, uh, there's a lot of good questions and I hope we can fit them in in the next um, eight minutes. Um, is there any reason to believe that the hearing aid tax credit and hearing aid, hearing aid coverage, both bills could pass? They seem um, not consistent with each other. Okay, um, the hearing aid tax credit we've supported for many years. It's been around a long time. Um, it has more sponsors than the Hearing Aid Coverage Act. I understand what you say, that they're not necessarily compatible. I'm not sure they're incompatible, but I will tell you from my perspective, neither bill will pass easily. Um, I really think that that it'll be, it's, it's going to be tough going for both. We've had the hearing aid tax credit going on for a long time. Um, and it's just not, it's not passed. We've raised a lot of awareness. We've made people aware of, what, of hearing loss. Uh, I feel like it's been good in that respect. Um, but I cannot tell you it's going to be passed instantly. Um, and, and, I, and I know for certain the Medicare bill is not, not happening very quickly either. So it, these are efforts that I feel that we need to make cause, because no one else will. If we don't keep working and plugging away, then it, it just won't happen. Okay, um, just to change the subject a little bit, Dee in Florida says, would it be helpful if all local chapters conducted an email blitz during one specific week so that we could hit all the powers that be with our plea for captioning as one example. We could email Bliss the content Lisa provides. We need time to coordinate it, but other causes on Facebook do this. And I think she brings up a good point is how we can really motivate um, chapters to get involved in our advocacy efforts. Um, I find, I find that chapters get involved in issues, uh, tend to get involved in more local issues than national issues. Um, we could do a blitz at some point. We're not quite ready on any of these issues to do a blitz, but I would be happy to do that and will at the point. What I hope to do with Medicare is build um, areas of support. We know Michigan is really strongly about I've been hearing from individuals. We'll take those areas and build support locally and then at some point we could put out a blitz. But I don't want to put out too many requests for action um, 
because I know that for a lot of people, advocacy is not top on their list. They want to socialize. They want to get access to equipment. They want to know technical stuff. So I want to be very mindful of the resources that you have. So we will do at times, and we have in the past, put out an action alert is what I'll call them. And if you have members who would like to be a part of that, please let me know. Send me an email, and I'll keep a list, and we'll send out these blitz. We'll send out to everyone, but I'll particularly let people know who really want to be involved in advocacy. Okay, back to the uh, hearing aid coverage question. Uh, is there any reason to worry that hearing aid manufacturers may be worried that if Medicare is required to provide coverage of hearing aids, then suddenly the federal government will have a tremendous amount of bargaining power to negotiate lower prices on hearing aids, reducing profit margins, margins on hearing aids? even though the manufacturers and audiologists may be able to sell a lot more hearing aids? Um, I think it is. Is that <laughs> it, Nancy? Okay. I think it is a concern. Yes. <laughs> I think they are. Um, we have found to date that the we work regularly on, on the tax credit bill with the Hearing Aid Manufacturers Association, HIA, and with the audiologist group, ASHA, AAA, and other, the other smaller groups. Um, they have not, every time I've brought it up, they have not been in favor of Medicare coverage. And they are worried. The audiologists and the dispensers are worried that the caps will mean that they cannot make the kind of profit they are now. The hearing aid manufacturers have already been selling their hearing aids to the VA, for example. So they, the largest buyer of hearing aids right now is the VA. And they do have the same model in Europe. The model in the United States, however, has been um, the model of a smaller market with higher prices rather than um, a, a larger market with lower prices. So we think there is concern, but we think that the best things for consumer is lower prices. And if we can get Medicare to do that, then um, we think the market will adjust. And the market will will they'll understand that they'll have a higher volume and more people who are satisfied in using them than having uh, many people who just can't afford to buy them. So our perspective is is that our number one concern is the consumer with hearing loss. Um, that the trade association for the manufacturers can worry about them, and the trade association for the audiologists and the dispensers can worry about their constituency. Our number one concern is you guys and me, a person with hearing loss. So that's where we are going to put our energy. Um, this next question may need uh, to be addressed offline, and I can give you the information. But uh, he's wondering if HLAA is involved with NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association. Um, there's a code um, NFPA 72. I'm not sure if we if we have any information that's kind of new uh, language to me. So he's provided a link, and I can give that to you, and maybe we can get back back okay. to him on that if he we provides have, his email. We us. have worked for NF, We have uh, worked with NFPA. We worked with um, on an advisory committee that has since closed down, but we, we are aware of some of the codes, and I'd be happy to talk more with you directly via email on that. I know we're getting to about a minute left here. Okay. Yes, uh, and I think at, at that point, I'll go ahead and thank uh, Cindy again very much for captioning. I know she has a, um, a hard stop at 9 o'clock, and I, and I don't want to keep her any longer than that. Um, again, if you have other questions that you'd like to ask Lisa, I'm sure she would welcome your email to lhamlin at hearingloss.org. Um, thank you again, Cindy, very much for excellent uh, CART this evening. Um, and thank you, Lisa Hamlin, for an excellent presentation. This was great. I did provide some links to where people can find our public policy uh, statements and our advocacy agenda on our website. So please take a look at those, those areas of our site. 
And um, at this point, I, I will say good night, and we will see you in June when we talk um, more about my favorite topic, the convention. So thanks again, everybody, for attending, and we'll see you next month. Thanks, Lisa. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.